biological and social systems. Um, what we're really interested in is like studying AI safety with the hope of learning valuable insights from the wide range of like other disciplines and interdisciplinary work. Um, so this particular species, uh, speaker series, what we're hoping to do is bring researchers working in areas adjacent to AI safety to discuss their research, with the aim of developing a resource for AI safety researchers to better see the connection between their work and work going on in other disciplines. Um, so if anyone is interested in like participating and writing maybe a blog post connecting uh, Javi's research to AI safety, please, uh, please reach out to me after the event. Um, I'm also going to ask if you all don't mind to share your emails in the chat. Uh, we'll just send like out a feedback form after the event, um, and, it, and we'll also use that to send out future invitations. Um, so uh, also just we actually have uh, Lynn Chu with us today. She's going to be doing the next series event, I think, tentatively in last week of January or first week in February. Um, she's a really cool philosopher of biology, so I think that'll be exciting. Um, so stay tuned for that. And uh, so anyway, yeah, so introduce uh, Javier uh, Gomez Levine. He's an assistant professor in philosophy at Purdue University, director of their newly found virtual reality and artificial intelligence lab and soon to be Purdue Normativity and Cognitions Experimental Philosophy Lab. Um, his dissertation, I'm sure you're going to talk about some of this, but his dissertation focuses on how the working, how working memory has been sort of used and assigned as the center of the mind, and he argues that there is no single purpose system that can carry out all the functions that psychologists and philosophers have assigned to the center of the mind. Uh, more generally, his research engages in empirically informed philosophy with a focus on how cognition arises and the way it shapes uh, the way it is shaped and is shaped by our moral, cultural, and social environments. So really excited to have Javi with us today. And I um, just want to spotlight you as the speaker now. Ah, and, big. I don't know. Oh, can you yeah. give me screen sharing though? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, now you can see how tired I am. <laughs> Should have put on more makeup. So let's see, share. All right. Should yeah. be able to now. This is looking like it's going to work. All right. Don't be afraid. It says 300 slides. We're not doing, there's a lot of backup slides. Uh, let me kind of make my, everybody can see my thing. Everybody can see my screen. I saw, I'm sorry if the like Zoom boxes uh, cover some up. All right. So what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about, uh, hold on one second. I'm just trying to get myself. There we go. Uh, coordinated. Ah. Sorry, moving my little Zoom window around so I can see the screen. I'm going to be talking about a whole pastiche of things that are uh, representative of my broader research project and which I'm really excited and developing currently in philosophy of cognitive science and um, more generally that I hope will have some applicability to AI and alignment issues. The way I've titled this talk is Dirty Concepts of Philosophical Laundering in cognitive science. And really, I, that's kind of false. I guess that's what I wanted. That's the goal set that I, I had, the goal uh, for myself before I started developing this talk. But, you know, as it's the end of semester, I've kind of had to reduce the scope a little bit. So we're really going to be looking at philosophical laundering and working memory. And I'm going to try to argue that what we see in working memory as a test case is, um, and what we've seen in cognitive science is more general, is this kind of filtering uh, maybe this pernicious filtering of pretty rich philosophical constructs into and folding them into contemporary discourse and working memory and contemporary functions of working memory um, in a way that kind of smuggles in theoretical commitments that may actually have downstream negative epistemic consequences by constraining the kinds of models of minds and agents that we're interested in studying. So it's a lot of stuff. There's going to be a bit of a shotgun approach here. I'm going to try to get through quickly so we can talk about it. And I'm happy to uh, take questions uh, once we kind of get through the lion's share of it. So how I'm going to argue this is I'm going to basically argue that once we have these uh, instances of philosophical laundering where we see these concepts being smuggled into philosophy, uh, sorry, into working memory from philosophy, what we need to do is use this other branded concept that I'm calling productive pessimism to basically disconnect the explanatory and what I'm going to call organizational properties of working memory as a cognitive construct. And in doing so, we kind of remove ourselves from this risk that 
laundering rich philosophical constructs into working memory are going to constrain the explanatory range of models uh, downstream of mentation and agency that we could get from working memory. That is to say, my broader project, and one I'm going to try to pitch to you guys, is laundering philosophical concepts into working memory is bad. Using productive pessimism, we can kind of get rid of some of the bad epistemic consequences of it. And we can do so in order to start fashioning um, what I hope to be my positive project, which is this kind of mosaic ontology of cognition that I think is hidden by a lot of these philosophical commitments and by working memories kind of hege hege hegemony. All right, so there's a lot to do. How are we gonna do it? I've broken it down. We're gonna look at some historical pessimism about explanation of cognition. We're gonna argue that pessimism can be productive when it decouples concepts, explanatory and organizational roles. I'm gonna then argue for a kind of pessimism regarding working memory, namely that it doesn't explain what it sets out to explain, but it rather redescribes cognition wholesale and kind of launders in these person level terms. There's also gonna be a neurological sidebar. I'm gonna, this, I'm gonna show you where I started thinking about this idea of laundering by looking at the notion of activity in neuroscience. Then I'm gonna show you uh, by looking backwards at working memory's history, we get this laundering of uh, subpersonal, sorry, of rich philosophical person level constructs into the subpersonal mechanisms of working memory. And finally, I'm going to end with a mini productive intervention about how working memory might be resuscitated as it might help us frame a new mosaic ontology of maintenance and manipulation in the brain. And that 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 kind of subsurface <laughs> mosaic of the many pathways that brains can maintain and manipulate information is something that we need to preserve and kind of highlight and bring to the surface. So uh, first, productive pessimism regarding cognition. I think the best way to actually kind of illustrate this is by showing the kind of traditionally highlighted predominant view, which is optimism regarding cognition. I think a lot of people historically and in contemporary circles kind of malign the pessimist piece. They're always saying, well, look, yeah, of course there's lots of problems, but hey, if we just do more experiments, if we get better technology, we can get better answers for cognition. So uh, William James, he's an imperfect hero here, and he's a complex figure, and I'm here kind of presenting a bit of a caricature, but I want to show that how he was kind of the, the reason we, we read James and not other scholars from the late 19th century when we're looking at contemporary, you know, father figures for, for psychology and cognitive science is because he was a kind of champion of this optimistic take. So he kind of dismisses a lot of these neo-Kantian pessimistic concerns in his principles of psychology. He says, the result of, of these concerns are various confused and scattered mysteries and unsatisfied intellectual desires. But why not pool our mysteries into one great mystery, the mystery that brain processes occasion knowledge at all? He says, all that psychology thus can do is to seek to determine what the several brain processes are. And this in a wretchedly imperfect way is what such writings have in the present chapter have begun to do. But if images reproduce, claiming to represent and put together by unifying actus of mind, I have been silent because such expressions either signify nothing or they are only roundabouts of simply saying the past is known when certain brain conditions are fulfilled. So he's basically saying, shut up with the kind of worries, worrisome philosophical conceptions and just do the science, you know? And I think that tends to be the predominant line that gets remembered and pushed on uh, in psychology as a kind of sociological phenomenon. And you can see this, right? So Horace Barlow, the late great um, British neuroscient uh, neuroscientist, he had his like five dogmas of neuroscience and in the seventies where he said, you know, in 10 years, we're going to have a full map of the human brain by the 1980s. And his first dogma, is, it's a kind of beautiful crystallization of this optimism, is that this idea that if we just have that, a, the, sorry, if we just have a description of that activity of a single nerve cell, which is transmitted to and influences other nerve cells, and, an, an, and of a nerve cell's response to such influences from other cells, that is a complete enough description for a functional understanding of the nervous system. So he's like, look, if we just understand how neurons talk to each other, which is a simple problem, this is just a coding problem, 
then we'll have a complete, we'll have a pretty good understanding of the nervous system. Hence this optimism that we would have kind of a readout of the brain in 10 years. And of course, this still gets boosted, right? So, you know, 10 years ago, we spent, the administration spent billions of dollars. And in Europe, there was a parallel project that spent billions of dollars to try to map out the brain in 10 years. And of course, the latest results from this are that it's going to take like another, you know, five decades or something. Um, and so I kind of want to highlight this pessimism regarding cognition, because I feel like it's always getting tampered down and put underneath the surface and maligned. And I think we can also trace a historical thread. So here's another one of my imperfect heroes. It's the person that James is actually responding to, and his name is George Trumbull Ladd. And he actually was uh, fired from his uh, from his like early chair of psychology at Yale for being a closeted Kantian metaphysician. And then he actually went to Japan uh, and kind of started uh, Western style psychology there in the eighteen hundred in the early nineteen hundreds. So kind of a fascinating figure. So here's his uh, principles of psychology textbook, which he published like three years before James. And James like cribs a lot from in some places uh, while dissing it and a lot of others. And here's one really fun kind of set of quotes. So he said, it's perfectly safe, however, to affirm of all the phenomena of the so-called higher faculties of mind, what Monsieur Ribot says of the study of abstract concepts, that they still fall outside the province of physiological psychology. Certain difficulties are so obviously intrinsic and essential to the very nature of the facts which the science attempts to deal with approaching those faculties that we cannot see, however, they will be successfully met. So super pessimistic. And he continues, the foregoing conclusions apply most obviously to the formation of abstract concepts, the conducting of trains of reasoning, the exercise of choice, the activities of creative imagination, scientific discovery, or mechanical invention. So he says all this stuff, the idea that we're going to have like brain processes that tell us how we do all this fancy cognition stuff is, he says, never going to happen. And then he continues slightly aside here. He says, in fact, the problem with psychology, according to Ladd at the time was the, that the application to mental phenomena of uncouth terms derived from the physical sciences, such as agglutination, agglomeration, cohesion, orgasmic phosphorescence, histiological cataplexy, has simply the effect of repeating certain psychical facts, so mental ideas and laws, in a less appropriate way without adding an item of information. This to me is kind of the one, uh, it's the signpost of some kind of laundering happening. He's saying like, look, what happens is mental stuff, things that we have pretty firm commitments to about mentation get smuggled in to contemporary science by these like weird, trendy words, things like, I don't know, um, uh, convolution and, and trans transformations and, uh, and, and, and uh, transformer models, all these things kind of just smuggle in certain kind of mental commitments maybe. Um, and of course, there's, of course, contemporary uh, pessimists, of course, the late great Jerry Fodor had this beautiful line in his modularity of mind. This is from my own copy. And he says he wants this thing to be known one day as Fodor's first law of the non-existence of cognitive science. And it goes like this. The more global, that is the more isotropic of cognitive processes, the less anybody understands it. Very global processes like analogical reasoning aren't understood at all. Kind of like what he was saying right here, right? <laughs> so he's basically saying we're, we don't know anything about Cognitive, cognition, right? And he even goes further. He says, in this respect, cognitive science hasn't even started. We are literally no further advanced than we were in the darkest days of behaviorism. So it's basically saying like the whole kit and caboodle, like everything that we consider to be progress in cognitive science is, you know, kind of an illusion. And I think people think he's joking there, but I think we should take that kind of threat very seriously, you know? It, like, I just as a sidebar, I, you know, I used to go around before they would kick me out of like cog sci conferences and ask like the grad students in front of the posters would be like, what do you think cognition is? And you ask a hundred different grad students, you get a hundred different answers. And you don't get that if you go to so like a biology conference, generally. I mean, they look at you weird, but they're like, biology is the study of life and living organ, you know. But in cognition, it's 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 kind of still a nebulous thing. Oh, okay. yeah. So sidebar, this is another hobby branded idea that I'm trying to flush out. So when is this pessimism productive? I said that it's been maligned, but we should respect it. Well, I think here we need to kind of look at Brahe. And I've been kind of reading up on Taike Brahe. He's, of course, the last naked eye astronomer who collated a bunch of data about his own observations. He was a very rich dude, had fancy instruments, um, though not telescopes. And, and in fact, jealously guarded his data, but he organized it meticulously. And it was Kepler who wanted to get the data, right? Because Kepler had a hinch that the data would show that his 
kind of uh, uh, heliocentric model was probably correct, right? So I, I, I call this kind of a Brahian ontology in honor of him. And that's this idea that concepts can marshal, collate, and organize data. They need, uh, and they can do so to allow for the better detection of patterns and reduction of error. Concepts and cognitive concepts should collate, marshal, and organize the reams of neuroscientific data that are coming out. They don't necessarily need to exp explain our manifest image of mentation. And what I mean here is really this kind of manifest image when we turn backwards and almost introspect, even in a scientific or philosophical sense, into the things that are, uh, sorry, into the processes that seem constitutive of mentation, we come to a very similar story. So this is something I've argued in a recent paper that Aristotle actually came up with working memory. His model is functionally very similar with fantasia. And I think we just, when we introspect and we try to say like, wow, what would, it, what would it take to build a mind like ours? We come up with very similar um, functional caricatures, right? We say, well, there has to be this generative thing and there should be this reflective thing. There should be this judgmenty thing. There should be this perceptual thing. And I worry that, the, you know, we're very attracted to that manifest image. I mean, for good reason, but I worry that that might be illusory and that might be actually constraining us in some sense. We shouldn't necessarily, just because we think and we hope that we have the capacity to generate like any thought possibly thought that, that's possible to think, you know, maybe we should allow our cognitive scientific concepts to float a little free from those goals, right? That's what I'm trying to argue. So when is pessimism productive? What is pessimistic or productive about this? What's pessimistic is that I'm arguing that cognitive concepts don't need to explain necessarily. That's not to say they won't, but that shouldn't be their first job. Working memory, reflection, deliberation, consciousness shouldn't have to explain some phenomena. Rather, they... I think in the first instance should be thought of things that help us organize, marshal, collate data to allow us, like Kepler looking at uh, Brahe's data, to see the kinds of patterns that we might need in order to um, refine our theories and reduce our error. So in this sense, to get to productive pessimism, you need to decouple explanation from organization. Okay, speeding through things again. Uh, I can't see anything. Why is this thing? I can't see. Sorry. I don't know what it says. It says something about working memory. Oh, yeah, I think it says something about working, the case of working memory. So a refresher, what is working memory for those of you who might not know? Well, back in the 20th century, you know, people would give you a phone number, like a 10 digit long number. So they would say like, my phone number is whatever it says there, one, two, one, two, whatever. And you would have to like go and somehow keep it in mind long enough to like write it down on a piece of paper. And so what would you do? Well, if you're an adult, you would probably say it to yourself sotto voce until it dissipates uh, or sorry, until you can write it down. So you would kind of recycle and say one, two, one, two, eight, one, seven, eight, six, one, five over and over. And if somebody interrupted you, you might forget it, right? Like if you don't keep up that process of, of rehearsal, you will lose that information. And so it's this idea that it's this working memories, this capacity that helps us bridge the recently experienced past to the present. And in some sense, that's kind of what James calls attention or consciousness. And also you can see it in our arguably Aristotle's Phanacea. So in a paper I just published with Justin Humphreys, we argue that these are parallel functional constructs. And in fact, a lot of the problems with describing Phanacea are same problems for working memory. Um, a little bit of a branding moment there. Okay, but we're scientists. We can't actually do anything with, what is this, Aristotelian constructs to bridge recent patterns. What is that? That's not a thing. So we have to be scientists. We have to turn it into operationalized terms. So I think this is a fair read from the literature. Happy to discuss this more in Q&A. But generally in cognitive science and psychology today, working memory is conceived as this ability that maintains or inclusive manipulates inform limited information no longer in the environment for short durations in the service of goal-directed behavior. So it's kind of like when you're like, um, you have to do like a remembering to, you know, you have to remember a phone number or better yet, like my kids, my, my students, they're like, what do you mean? Remember a phone number in your head? Like, I just, I just put it on my phone. Like, but I think it's, I think the closer model now is probably like when you get one of those like two factor codes and you have to like take it from the phone and try to type it in, that might be a closer one. But I think we do this all the time. So let's say you have a recipe and your recipe is for like guacamole and you're at the supermarket and you're like, oh, wait, what, what, what do I need for guacamole? And then you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. I need to 
kind of take that experience and re put it in front of my mind. And then you're like, okay, I need to look for limes and cilantro and, and avocados. And so you have those things in mind and then you see the limes and then you have to search for avocados, which are also green. And you're kind of keeping these things actively in mind as you guide your way through the produce aisle, I guess. Okay, so what's at stake? Well, if you talk to one of the godfathers of working memory, Alan Baddeley, arguably a lot. <laughs> So this is like his first line in his 2007 book where he says, and you can, the QR code should ideally link you to the source, uh, that working memory is assumed by him to be a temporary storage system under attentional control that underpins our capacity for complex luck. So basically it's everything. And again, uh, analogy with Fantasia, Aristotle argues Fantasia, which he, it's a similar capacity that allows you to retain information from the environment that's no longer there. He says, there is no thought without Fantasia. So, I mean, you know, this is kind of a parallel um, and, and it's a big job to do. Uh, this is filtered in now to philosophy by Peter Carruthers, who arguably wrote the strongest, most well-articulated kind of defense of working memory and philosophical lines in 2015. But he actually kind of sees a lot of philosophical promise in this idea. He actually says many philosophers are then committed to the view of the mind uh, that contains a central workspace within which concepts can be freely combined with one another and which our attitudes of all types can become active, engaging with one another and with systems of inference and decision making. Okay, so there's a central whiteboard where all this stuff happens, right? Uh, lots of stuff. Ah, and then he says, there is indeed the central workspace in the mind whose contents are always conscious. This is so-called working memory, which has been heavily studied by scientific psychologists for the last 30 years more. So it's like, surprise, we have this thing that we need to do all this interesting cognitive work. And in fact, it's been taken to explain first order theories of consciousness. So we have global workspace views, attention-based views that kind of really take up working memory in various forms. Reflective accounts of deliberation, including Carruthers, but argue, arguably Aristotle's own account of uh, sorry of um, virtue and the phronimos and the develop, development of the intellectual virtues requires, according to Jessica Moss, fantasia to see like the apparent good. Uh, dual system models of reasoning. So this is, of course, Stan Evich and Evans, but also Jen Nagel has work on this that, you know, you can divide the mind into two you know, evolutionary new and old or, you know, fast and slow or as they put it, type one and type or system one, system two. And the only real distinction between system one and system two for Stanovich and Evans is that system two is working memory. <laughs> That's it. everything else and then working memory. Um, and of course, Devin Curry, a good friend of mine, has a new paper, you know, hooking up general intelligence, G, fluid intelligence to working memory as well. I say no, doesn't explain any of this. In fact, in a recent paper, I just argue that, in fact, it, it just re-describes cognition. It doesn't do any explanatory lifting. So there's a recap of that argument that the first move is that there's no theoretical unity in working memory. We actually see this kind of fractionization of these models from the earliest that had working memory as this unitary thing to Baddeley's popular multi-component model to new state-based models, which are trendier in neuroscience. And so if we have no theoretical unity, we can maybe look at a functional unity or functional core for working memory. And that is that working memory are the functions of maintenance or manipulation of information. Again, this is their operationalization before. And sidebar, okay, now we're gonna dive into the neuroscience, uh, kind of focusing on this issue of maintenance and manipulation and extracting, I think, an interesting example of philosophical laundering. So we can ask the question, well, which structures or mechanism underwrite working memory functions of maintenance and manipulation? Um, for a long time, I think it was settled in the 90s by Patricia Goldman Reykjavik and uh, Funahashi uh, that it was the prefrontal cortex. You know, the prefrontal cortex, the most evolved part of the neocortex, which, you know, only develops once you're like 25, or in my case, probably 30, is the thing that holds working memory content. So, you know, when you have to hold a phone number in mind, it's in prefrontal cortex, right? And this is, you know, again, they... This was cemented in the 90s, and it's this idea, I think this is a direct quote from Patricia, that delay period activity in the prefrontal cortex is a neural correlate of the temporary active maintenance of information, which is, of course, our golden operationalization of working memory. This is since, and this is what I grew up with. This was like when I was a psych BS student, this was like the, you know, in the chapter, the Gazaniga chapter in working memory, it's like, it's PFC. This is not the case anymore. There's a lot of reasons um, 
one, which I'm not going to go into, but we can in Q and A, is that maintenance of information via delay period activity via this mechanism of holding of neuron spiking when the stimulus is removed is a property we see everywhere. It's just a generic feature of the brain. It looks like it just it just happens all the time. But also, it looks like many mechanisms are instantiating uh, maintenance of information. So this is the one I'm going to focus on here for reasons that I hope will become apparent. So first you should start with the question, well, is there a univocal, a singular mechanism for maintenance? And this would be beautiful if you wanted to argue that working memory is a natural kind construct. And the, argu the argument I wanna push is no, there's at least two and probably a lot more. One is this kind of delay period activity in the prefront or delay period activity, just simpliciter, this idea that, and this is very common. This was like the, I mean, this goes back to Huxley. I mean, in the 19th century, right? It's this idea that, uh, 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 neurons encode information by spiking, right? By firing. And that's the idea, right? It's core to neuroscience. It's a dogma. But uh, there's been recent evidence that there's actually other things, other mechanisms, mysterious things, calcium kinetics, subthreshold dynamics, um, um, synaptic cha changes on the dendrites of the synapses, uh, morphological things, temporary states, glial cells, uh, you know, modulating various things. And this has been the debate of so-called activity silent working memory, this idea that we can find we can find evidence that something must have been there, but we can't see the, the causal oomph vehicle that got us there. Okay, so uh, one is, of course, increasing neural firing. The other so mechanism is we don't know. It's uh, whatever. You fill in the blank. So I'm going to kind of explain that because I'm very excited by this and I'm trying to work up a paper. It, the problem is there's a publication like every month. So uh, I'm trying to kind of figure out a, an angle that I don't have to cite all the research on. So maybe you can help with that. So activity silent paradigms, what are they? These were pioneered by Brad Postle and uh, Jared Lewis Peacock. Just giving you a quick example. This is called the switch trial. And that's the example that they really highlighted in, as this uh, activity silent, you know, Evidence for activity, evidence for activity science. It's a null result, but okay. So what happens in these experiments? Well, you often have three different kinds of stimuli to remember. Here's just two. So you have a kind of word that you have to remember, and then you have orientations of lines that you have to remember. And the word can be something like uh, they're they're kind of um, semantic matches. So the the correct match for think would be something like book or school, right? If I showed you uh, eat, then cake would be a good match, right? And the line orientations, I believe that they're looking at, um, they have to be acute or they can't be mismatchy. I can't remember. They have various permutations of this. They also have a baseline condition as well, which I'm not going to go into. So the subject is presented with two stimuli that they have to remember. Then there's a cue that tells them, hey, I'm going to ask you about the top stimuli or the lower stimuli. Here it's the top. And then there's a probe. So in this case, the target was think. That was cued. The probe is bake. And then they have to respond, is this a semantic match or not? Here it would be no, okay? But it doesn't end there. Then they get a second cue. It can either cue the same stimulus or it can switch as in the switch trial case here where it's cueing the, the line orientation. So now they're saying, hey, remember those lines? Uh, are these similar or not? Here it would be not because they aren't acute in the same way or whatever. Okay, so then what they did is they recorded fMRI data on this and they trained a linear classifier on that data to try to see using multivoxel pattern analysis whether they could extract the representation of these things held in memory in working memory, held in working memory uh, over the epic, over the time course of the trial. So I'm gonna try to model that here. I'm going to put the time course of extraction, sorry, linear classifier extraction percentage in, of the semantic content in red, whereas I'm going to put the line orientations in blue and baseline will be in gray. Okay. So once they encode the information, statistically, it's in, you know, they can extract the same amount of representational construct from the MVPA data for both stimuli. Then they get the first cue, and you see the separation of what the classifier can extract, where it can't, it starts to not be able to extract the uh, orientation representation. 
And we see this go where the orientation representation actually goes to baseline. So it, it's unextractable at this point. It's basically the same as trying to extract the non-remembered, you know, other stimulus that we're not talking about. And we see that we can extract more information, or sorry, more of a representation from that original semantic encoding. So what happens when we switch the trials? Uh, well, in cases when people had successful task performance, which was pretty high, I believe, uh, we see this inflection, right? Which is just wild. Okay, so basically, obviously with the second key, which says, hey, remember those line orientations, I'm about to ask you about them. We see that the uh, classifier can't, it can no longer, starts to quickly drop off the amount of representational, uh, representation, semantic representation it can extract. And we see this like coming back from the dead, coming back from baseline, this uh, activation that's associated with uh, the line orientation being able to be extracted by the classifier. And this is bonkers, right? Because they're like, wait, where did the representation go? <laughs> you know? Like this is supposed to be measuring metabolic and electrical data. They did it with the EEG as well and they found the same results. Metabolic and electrical data that's, uh, sorry, representational activation strength that's associated with uh, the, the, the stimuli and it goes to baseline. It's basically unextractable with the current methods we have. So it's not being held by like delay period activation. And yet people can like just out of nowhere reconstruct it like it comes back from where where did it go right this is the problem of activity uh, silent working memory so preliminary conclusions that increase activation that is to say where that's can be measured by fmri or eeg may not be necessary for the maintenance of things of representations in the mind um this is kind of what they say the sustained activation of a stimulus representation which is what we thought was like the code. It's the thing that Horace Barlow was like, this is going to give us the map of the mind. It's not necessary for short-term retention. This activity instead corresponds to the focus of attention. And a couple other conclusions I'm not going to talk about. That's an intermediate activation uh, views of working memory may be an artifact, which can talk about more. And the MVPA, so this other technique of extracting representations may be more sensitive to distributed patterns of information. Um, some interesting epistemic results that I'm trying to write up in a new paper are that, well, I mean, here's one problem that these studies are all null results. So how are we supposed to interpret that? Like we didn't find the thing. So how are we trying to conclude that there is an absence of a mechanism, right? That seems a little weird. There's interpretive issues between classical GLM style univariate fMRI data and this newfangled MV, not new anymore, but MVPA data. Neuroimaging seems to be, it could be rife with type two errors, which doesn't surprise me, but you know, it's kind of heretical to say. And finally, something I think that's the interesting laundering angle is what do we mean by activity neuroscience? Like in some sense, what does activity science, uh, activity science mean? Like activity, si like something is still happening, right? It's not like we don't, we don't think that there's a ghost in the machine and the, the representation really just vanished, right? <laughs> and like, that's not how, you know, material things work and that exist over time. Like it was there, it's just we can't see it with the current methods we have. So it's activity silent, but it's still something. It's still some proactive process in like the Aristotelian sense of it. So calling it activity silent activities just incoherent, but it can get much worse. So I'm saying that they are kind of calling it activity silent activity. It's just this kind of X factor. So, and I don't mean to poo-poo on these authors here because I, I just, this one sentence is excellent for my example. I think you can do this with most papers in neuroscience. So here's a paper on uh, basically working memory tasks and primates. And let's just read this. It's, it's a beautiful example of what I'm trying to say. No neurons. The presence of active no neurons in addition to active yes neurons is an important finding of our study. During the delayed decision process, no cells encoded the decision actively by modulating their activity more strongly for no decisions, even in the absence of sensory evidence. So we have four instances of activity, three different kinds too. One's like active as an adjective, active no neurons. Then one's as an adverb, right? They encoded decisions actively and they did it through this process that's activity, right? So there's three kinds of activity that are in this one sentence. And I'm like, we could just, it's, it's bonkers, right? We could just remove them. Why not remove them? Just like, let, let's read it now. The presence of no neurons in addition to yes neurons is an important finding of our study. During the delayed decision process, no cells encoded the decision by modulating more strongly for no decision. 
it's completely semantically the same. Like, why are we even putting in activity? What do we gain by using this word? And I think this is an example of some kind of wandering. It's not quite the philosophical kind, maybe. I just think it's weird. <laughs> and it's it's been something I've been wrestling with. I'd love to get more input on from you all. But like in some sense, like what is activity doing here? Is it signaling like the importance of the thing? Is it signaling like the target of the of the of the empirical question? Is it signaling kind of a causalness? And I think that's what it is. I think in at least in neuroscience context, activity is just this uh is just this 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 this, this signpost. To be like, this is the thing that's doing the wiggling that's changing the phenomena, right? It's this causal, it's this, oh, this is supposed to be gone. It's supposed to say, it's this causal signpost, basically, um, for better or for worse. But I think we, if that's true, we need to be more active about dealing with that. Okay, end sidebar, sorry, quick, back to uh, working memory. So the argument in the paper is something like this. If working memory is broadly construed as generic maintenance of information to do stuff with it, well, that's everywhere. And there's many mechanisms that do that, as we just saw. So in some sense, it, it's just, you know, another word for the kind of maintenance that is itself associated with a whole host of cognitive tasks. It doesn't do anything itself. We should just talk about like this, this phenomena that's this generic kind of maintenance that's necessary for most of cognition. You could then restrict it, which is what most defenders of working memory do, including uh, Brad Postel. They say, no, 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 no. It's not just dump. It's not just short-term memory. It's a specific, it's more rich, it's more robust. It's a kind, it's specific subset of mechanisms. And that specific subsets of mechanisms actually track this more fine-grained thing called manipulation, which is harder. And manipulation is the thing because it's, it's the essential component of this rich kind of repertoire of central cognitive tasks. The problem is that the way they measure it, right, manipulation is through this kind of ad hoc assortment of things that are like alphabetization or like arithmetic, or they are just central cognitive tasks, right? So in some sense, if we're just saying like, oh, wow, we're interested in studying how we do hard cognitive things, why not just study those things? Why call it this empty middleman called working memory that lurks in the background? So in some sense, either it's so broad as to basically just redescribe cognition, or you you successfully defended a work mechanism associated with working memory, but it's it's a middleman. Just call it alpha, you know, the thing that's responsible for alphabetization or arithmetic. You know, why call it something spooky that's more general that <laughs> that uh, doesn't really do anything about working or memory? It's about you know, alphabetizing. All right, so in my argument, working memory doesn't explain any of these things. It just redescribes. It's a new way of describing. Uh, our commitments about consciousness, deliberation, reasoning, and intelligence. And these are rich person-level phenomena. And in some sense, it's laundering in <laughs> our commitments, our mental commitments, our mental manifest, philoso sorry, our philosophical commitments about these mental manifest images that we've had for a very long time into a scientific package, right? And into our concept of cognition. Which, and, and in some sense, we're just recapitulating you know, this worry that Lad had of like, wait, we can't just have these same psychical mental questions and just repackage them with a fancy psych scientific term and call it like explained. <laughs> um, okay, we're almost done. I'm going to take a little break to drink some water. Sorry for going fast. Want to cover a lot. Love to get your feedback. Okay, what happened and where do we go? Well, and this new paper I have, which I, I will be presenting at the Pacific APA, I believe. Um, so come on by if you're in San Francisco. I mean, I, I, I try to kind of argue this. Uh, I've tried to argue that maybe what we need to do, maybe working memory has just gotten so bloated and it's gotten all these, everybody's kind of glommed stuff onto it. And, and maybe if we go back to basics, if we go back in its history, we can find like an epistemically pure like original version of working memory. And here I'm really inspired by my colleague, David Colasal's arguments that he brought up about LTP. So long-term potentiation had a similar thing where originally it was conceived in the seventies as a simple mechanism that helped explain a particular kind of learning in, in the brain. And in the like nineties and early aughts, it was just, everything was LTP. Like everything was long-term potentiation. And it, it, to the point that some argue that, hey, maybe we should go back to that original, very small mathematical model of this one kind of learning and this one kind of task. So I was inspired to go back to basics, but it's not good. <laughs> I'm here to report 
that if you go back to basics with working memory, it just gets worse. Um, and there are three problems. One is this kind of laundering, which I mean, here I just say it's just one part of it, but it's really most of it. It's and which is really what I've already just talked about. It's this idea that working memory launders pretty robust philosophical terms or or commitments about mentation into the subpersonal processes that it has reign over. Um, and this is something I actually started working on with Lisa Meraki when I was a postdoc at Penn. And we have a paper. Actually, Lisa wants to do this specifically for AI. Um, so it's something that we should definitely consider, you know, y'all should consider having her here soon. It's just we both both with the pandemic and everything, we're delayed on this. So maybe it would be a good kick in the pants to get us to uh, get this uh, paper on. Um, so she's arguing that we do the same thing with our concepts of AI. We launder in these robust mental commitments. Uh, and here's an example, just a generic example, and then I'll kind of drill in. So let's say you're a philosopher. And let's say you have kind of a model of what agents are. Like agents are these things that can, you know, uh, will. And when they will things, they should act in accordance to certain rules to be rational. And so some of those rules are that they shouldn't have like competing sources of uh, contradictory beliefs in mind. And so to be rational, you should make sure before you assent to a belief that you have no contradictory evidence or contradictory beliefs to that, not just evidence. It was not a Bayesian. Um, and you're like, okay, cool. That sounds like a pretty good, you know, model of a um, philosophical model of, of agency. The problem is then if that becomes baked into this <laughs> commitment that agents should be rational and rationality means that they shouldn't have contradictory beliefs. If that becomes ossified in there, it can have downstream consequences on the kinds of models of mentation that you might be looking for. So you might be looking for something in the head that explains these kinds of ossified philosophical commitments to agency that we have from like racist enlightenment authors. Um, and so, you know, this is just a model of that, that these, these, these commitments uh, that are philosophical can cause downstream constraints on the kinds of models that we're willing to consider as good models for mentation. And actually the more extreme version of this is, is, is heretical, right? But it's something like um, going back to Fodor, uh, remember Fodor's like, hey, there's no cognition, there's no cognitive science because cognitive uh, processes are global and there's no computational story to tell about global processes. And maybe you just have to kind of get rid of some of those premises and you might have to look for mental models that of, of the mind that may not meet those high computational threshold. That's heretical, right? You're basically saying like, wait, you mean the mind might not be infinitely generative, productive and systematic? And it's like, that's an empirical question. Like we, we need to have and, and have a, the kinds of models that could sort and organize the data in such a way that maybe we should give up those kinds of uh, robust commitments. Let me just give you a more specific example. In working memory, this was like Atkinson and Schifrin's. They were the original mathematical psychologists that took working memory from computer science, from Newell and Simon, who used it in their logic theory machine, and put it into, which is again, kind of laundering in a weird way, right? Use, going from computer science where this thing has an infinite working memory that just stores information and then being like, oh, we humans must have this. Um, and so they gave a model, the first model of it. And there's a lot in there, but they have this beautiful little quote where they say, okay, the process is carried out in the short-term store under immediate control of the subject and govern the flow of information. They can be called into play at the subject's discretion. So basically they argue that working memory processes are voluntary. They're always voluntary. So we can voluntarily execute these various computational tasks. And in so doing, we can expand our performance ability on cognitive tasks. Um, Badele, so this was the original model. This didn't have a lot of traction. Uh, Badele's model that came out four, four years after uh, Atkinson and Schifrin model basically decomposed the short-term store working memory into various sub components. And if you notice, and I'd love to do like a more careful history of this, that the notion of voluntariness or volition totally disappears. There's no more talk about that. There's no talk about consciousness until the 90s where he adds this thing called the episodic buffer to explain it. It really is supposed to be this like total subpersonal decomposed thing. Uh, there's no volition. 
there's none of that kind of spooky talk. Fast forward, you know, uh, 50 years, well, almost 50 years from Battle to Earl K. Miller, who's like a working memory god at MIT now. And here's his new working memory 2.0. He says, working memory is a fun fundamental function by which we break free from reflexive input output reactions to gain control over our own thoughts. So it's it's a volition, it's, it's the way we get volition over our cognitive processes. It has two types of mechanisms, online maintenance of information and its volitional or executive control. So <sighs> working memory is a thing that's supposed to explain how we get this voluntary control <laughs> and how it does it is by itself having a voluntary mini system in it. I mean, it, Miller is very smart. So he's not really committing a homuncular fallacy here, but I'm just saying you can see how these terms like volition get like percolated in, go subsurface and then come back out without much of a consideration of like, wait, what do you mean by willful control of information here? And you also see laundering and how working memory fuses the kind of subpersonal mechanistic descriptions. So these things, the two types of mechanisms, one of which is voluntary control with person level terms like voluntariness. <laughs> And this has been going on forever. And I'm going to show you an example of it towards the end of the talk. Um, just as an example here, I'm going to show you a really good example of it later, but here's just a quick example. This is Atkinson and Schifrin's original model. As you notice, this is like, this is the model for human information processing. The very center of it is this short-term store called temporary working memory. And in temporary working memory, there's a voluntary use of these control processes, rehearsal, coding, imaging, decisions, retrieval strategies, et cetera. So these are pretty robust things like decision-making, imagining, uh, you know, coding and actually like willful control of these things are personal level, almost personal level processes. Like arguably decision-making is a, is not something that's a subpersonal mechanistic thing. It is a bare plethora of all these things that are associated with these class of behavioral tasks. And they even kind of go further. They say, because consciousness, which is pretty person level, is equated, equated with the short-term store, and because control processes are in and act through the, so the myriology here is just bonkers. Because control processes are centered in and act through the short-term store, it is considered a working memory, a system in which decisions are made, problems are solved, and information flow is directed. And this kind of weirdness was not unnoticed. So in fact, uh, uh, there's a negative review of this model by Craig and Levy eight years after it came out. And they say, in this sense, the short-term store of Atkinson and Schifrin is much more than a simple stage of learning. It is the control center for all cognitive activity. And I feel like that commitment also gets laundered into working memory. You see that, I mean, we saw that this is 76 and then in Baddeley's book, it's like working memory is the thing that underwrites cognition, right? Finally, this is something I'm also working on is this idea that the interfacing work. So like the work of like doing the dirty, like, okay, which mechanisms are actually in working memory and like how do they work is de-emphasized in favor of these outward facing explanations. So this is this idea I'm trying to call the two faces of working memory that it has this kind of, it straddles this um, subpersonal and person level distinction. And it, it has these kind of this, this janitorial, like actually like Janus was the god of like pathways and doors. It has this kind of gatekeeping function, but unfortunately, especially in philosophy, we emphasize how working memory is this magic thing that explains all these other things that we have mental commitments to that we launder into working memory. So it's like, surprise, oh, wait, you know, you're looking around, you, you have a new book on consciousness and you're like, wow, I really wish there was something that science has like shown about consciousness. <gasps> wow, there's this thing, it's this black box, it's been studied for 40 years, it's called working memory. And look, there's all these scientists saying consciousness is equated with it. Consciousness is a function of the episodic buffer to hand, Con you know, um, the global workspace is basically working memory. Um, it's like, wow, this thing's perfect. And yet really what we've done is we've basically uncritically laundered in pretty strong commitments about what a person level construct like consciousness is into the construct of working memory. <laughs> and so it's no surprise <laughs> It helps solve those problems because it basically redescribes a lot of our commitments to them, probably. So, I'm, but I'm not saying we throw it all out. I think the interfacing work is interesting. And my last part of the talk will kind of conclude by trying to resuscitate some of it.
So again, a lot of wandering happening. I need to kind of sort through it. So I'm not quite there yet, but I would like to sort it into little, that was supposed to be a pun, but I sort it into little piles. Okay, almost done, I promise. Sorry for going too fast. Ah, they should sponsor me, LaCroix. Where do we go from here? Well, again, we have to adopt that specter that's been haunting us of productive pessimism, which I really should, I have in a couple little papers, I've peppered it in, but I need to just suck it up and write a kind of full-throated account of it. The problem is I wasn't trained as a philosopher of science, so I always get a little anxious making very explicit claims about philosophy of science. Um, okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, remember that productive pessimism, sorry, it's supposed to decouple the explanatory from the organizational kind of uh, pattern developing roles of concepts. So if remember for it to be pessimistic, we're giving, a, we're giving up explanation in exchange for this organizational power. So how do we organize the multiple realizers of maintenance and manipulation, which is the, that fundamental core of working memory that is that inner, that, that, sorry, that's captured by those interfacing subpersonal mechanisms. I don't think, I think it's obvious that there are maintenance and manipulation are things that trivially almost any computational system that exists in and over time do with information. It's like just a generic thing, right? Like three rings, you know, arguably, you know, maintain information about their age. Like neurons maintain information by like regulating the gradient. I mean, yeah, you see maintenance of information is just a kind of trivial, it's something that falls out that then systems can use in interesting ways. And you don't even have to have like brains, right? So like, uh, state-based could like uh, maintain information depending on what state it's in, right? It kind of knows, well, if I'm in this state, or I must have gotten one of these two things before me. Uh, so how do we find these many maintenance, the realizers of maintenance and manipulation? And how do these realizers maybe reflect this, this promissory note I have of this mosaic ontology of cognition? Well, arguably, I want to argue the way we organize these mid-level realizers is by kind of respecting an, a mid-level of organization. So this is in contrast to like top-down accounts or even bottom-up accounts that kind of privilege just the neurological story or just the autonomous psychological story. I'm trying to argue there's this kind of middle ground, this nebulous middle functional ground that we need to maybe put more stock into. So remember, if we accept that working memory is just the maintenance and manipulation of information and that working memory is just a scientifically vetted term for cognition. Well, you know, fortunately, what working memory researchers, a lot of whom have done over the last 50 years is actually come up with some of these, right? So in my own work, uh, we looked at how interparietal sulcus is responsible for the maintenance of category labels. Other people look at how like top-down modulation of visual cortical activity is necessary to perform certain tasks. Like there's all these stories that tell us that like, hey, brain region A is responsible for task B through process C, right? That's a mid-level kind of functional story that has a computational angle that's one of the many ways that brains maintain and manipulate information. The, the key point of my, my view about working memory is there doesn't have to be one magic kind or one magic mechanism for maintenance and manipulation. We should let a thousand flowers bloom. So how do we find these? One way, and this is something I'm developing actually with Witt Schombein and actually with a grad student at University of Cincinnati, Elmo, I can't pronounce his last name, but he's amazing. He's on Twitter, good friend of Zach's, I hope. Um, <laughs> is the second paragraph rule. So basically take your generic paper on working memory. What you'll find is the first paragraph always, almost always has the same story. Working memory is a cognitive operation that underlies our ability to temporarily maintain and manipulate attended information in the mind when it's no longer accessible in the environment to guide behavior. I mean, this is the same thing every fucking time. But in the second paragraph, they'll actually tell you, or second page or third page, they'll actually tell you what the study is actually doing. So what they're doing here is not trying to figure out like what is the thing that is generally maintaining information to guide behavior. No, they are looking at how working memory performance in the setting of distracting information is associated with top-down modulation of activity in visual cortices during early visual processing. That's a real thing. That is a real candidate process. That like one of the ways that we keep ourselves on task is by having 
a top-down modulation of activity in these circumstances, and we can model it, and we can give you a computational story for it, and that might be one way that we help maintain information. That's not gonna explain consciousness, deliberation, reflection, imagination, no. But it will explain how some people are good at this like one little task, which is fine, that's great. So what I wanna do in some dream is work with a computer scientist like my good friend with Chambine, take a bunch of these papers, put them through some magical machine learning and actually extract some of these candidate mid-level constructs, right? Because I think what we'll see is there will be islands where like researchers are really, you know, this group of researchers, they all say they're working memory, but Really, they're talking about how like interparietal sulcus is responsible for X or how prefrontal cortex is responsible for maintaining Y or how modulating temporal lobes is responsible for semantic information. Those are candidate mechanisms that explain the many ways that we maintain and manipulate information. And the story here is that that, mosaic, that, that group of mechanisms is actually an interesting glimpse at how cognition works in the human brain. And I would like to adopt that. I've been talking to Russ Paldrack, who's the director of Cognitive Atlas, and maybe create a version of Cognitive Atlas that has these mid-level constructs. I should say, I pitched it to him. I, I think we're, I'd like to talk more and develop that. I think in a future, that would be great to have that in the Cognitive Atlas. Okay, so quickly, how do these realize the reflective mosaic ontology of cognition? Well, I think as I've been kind of hammering home here, there's so many mid-level constructs that realize maintenance and manipulation of information. So some of those things will be like what we talked about, like these inner parietal sulci or top-down, they're cortical processes, right? That neuroscientists are looking at. They will be like in the head, but they don't just have to be in the head, <laughs> okay? That's the functional beauty here. Some can extend outside the head. And in fact, if you go back to one of the first like pre-mathematical psychology views of working memory, uses of working memory in psychology, it's this book by Miller and a couple others, I can't pronounce the names, called Plans and the Structure of Behavior. And in it, they actually kind of talk about working memory in this like very vague psychological way. They basically say, the kind of working memory that people prefer to use when they're executing a plan seems to represent a characteristic difference, like a different of difference of character, okay? One person will insist on writing things down, running his life from a calendar pad, whereas another will keep in his own head everything he intends to do. And they go on. There's many versions of this. Basically, they think working memory is as working memory does. You're, this is a, you know, it's like, it's like the extended mind. This is a working memory. This is, the frontal lobes are working memory. Working memory is as working memory does. So it's, you know, they're not committed to this like kind of weird, like there must be a single mechanism, natural kind view that Carruthers kind of distilled in 2015. We can use language. We can use culture. We can use our interactions with others. And here's my pitch for how like all my other work in XFi kind of works with this story, right? It's like, in fact, Often we're using others in language and culture and artifacts to kind of maintain and manipulate information. Okay, so how do these um, uh, realize the reflective mosaic ontology? Well, again, it's by cataloging the many ways that maintenance and manipulation of information can take for cognition that we can start to glimpse a mosaic ontology that is more accurate and better describes what cognition is. Again, this is back to the Brahim principle that cognitive concepts should marshal, collate, and organize data. And that we've already begun to do this. We've already, be, that's what, we don't have to throw away working memory and all the work that scientists have done. We just need to kind of remove them from this, you know, spell that there will be this magic mechanism at the end of the day that's associated with all this beautiful cognitive work that we, we've kind of wandered into working memory to begin with. It might be mid-level realizers. It might be things that extend outside the head. Working memory is probably going to be this mosaic construct of the many pathways that maintenance and manipulation takes can take. And insofar as we want to keep it around, we should want to keep around working memory as a framework for looking at that mosaic reality underlying cognition. Oof. Thank you all so much. I really Okay, so I think the first question is something like, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, like, it seems to me that like most of the discussion around working memory seems to be 
like some, somewhat related, like it seems like some of it is related to like this notion of volition um, and like, like voluntariness and that sort of a thing. Um, it seems to me some other aspect is about the relationship between working memory and extended memory, right? And like the last part that you presented seemed to me to be talking something about the alternative ways of talking about how cognition could be related to like the, these ways in which like information is tracked or information is like um, embedded in situation or something. Um, I'm curious if like those two notions can be decoupled in a way in which like one could still like comfortably talk about the, the second without talking about the first or something. Yeah. So um so I bet so is what you're saying something like we can we should we should maybe maybe one thing that we would want to do is to take to separate out our like psychological commitments about working memory and it's related and it's relation to the psychological level constructs of like well memory and learning and attention and, and consciousness and so forth. And we can maybe still have this functional picture of like, okay, well, functionally speaking, if you're trying to make a system that has, you know, memory, sorry, that has, um, that can perform these tasks and it needs to have some kind of way to like attend and judge and compare and, oh wait, it turns out we might want to have like a single box that a lot of those things draw from, you know, who cares about the neuroscience in some sense? Like we just, we're trying to model a kind of functional reality uh, right. and we can have that story separate from Oh, and like, and then we can have a concern about laundering in that story about like, wait, are we like, should we police out like two humanistic constructs like voluntariness, which might be a little hard. And can we have that story separate from like, okay, wait, now that we're looking at the neurological level, oh, it looks like um, we have working memory. Oh, but it's like, oh no, it looks like we have this explosion of, of mechanisms that are realized in the brain that do all this fun computational work, but like that seems like a separate discussion from, or we, maybe it would be beneficial to separate that discussion from the first. Is that kind of what you're arguing or what you're trying to propose? Yeah, like, yeah I, I'm trying to see like, if like that sort of like distinction like yeah. you make in, in the sort of like philosophical critique of like. So I, 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 I think, I think that's a really good point. My int I'm just gonna give you a cheap answer. Um, So, so I'm going to go back to like, if I had like a lot of time, I really want to have done just like a new PowerPoint. This was a bit of a Frankenstein job of a bunch of different talks uh, that are like I'm trying that are percolating in my mind as I'm writing these papers. I think I'd want to give more about the story, right? The story of like, like once upon a time, there were these philosophers who like try to do what Hume calls like mental cartography. You know, they're trying to figure out like, what are like, when we turn inwards and do cheap introspection, what are the laws and like the properties and the, the systems that govern minds and things with minds and things that we would want to say have minds. Um, and that that story of those constructs, which some of which you can trace, like I think all the way back to like Aristotle and you can see through like Ibn Sina and how they were like changed in medieval philosophy and medieval Islamic philosophy. Then you can see how they percolate into the moderns into people like Hume and Descartes and eventually to Kant, how those have had these like long projections and tendrils and grips on the kinds of the kind of search that we do in, in psychology and cognitive science. And then maybe that that search needs to be done with a kind of critical conceptual eye to the history and baggage of these commitments. So that's kind of, I think the origin, one of the origin stories of this laundering thing is that even if you wanted to separate this stuff, which is, I, I'm gonna try to argue in the next minute or two that we shouldn't want to, but even if you wanted to, there's this threat of laundering that needs to be taken seriously, especially if you're a scientist. And you have to be like, wait, why are we committed to like finding minds that do these things? Like we can just, and, and I think this is something that scientists are starting to do, right? So you see um, John Krakauer from uh, Johns Hopkins. He has a really good paper on like, does neuro, why neuroscience needs behavior. And he's like, we need to have better association of the tasks 
Like the tasks and the behaviors that we're looking at, those should be the things driving our theories, not like our reaching out for like, you know, decision making. Like what's decision making besides what we kind of uh, accept as consensus is like a group of tasks. And that sounds like behaviorism in a way, right? So it is kind of a behaviorism. Um, so I, I think that scientists are doing it. I'm just, I think you could still take that seriously. I think the interesting thing is that working memory is unique, right? It's, 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 it's very special. Um, and I think part of its allure, part of the reason why it keeps popping up all the freaking time, arguably since Aristotle, um, is because there's something true to it that we do maintain and manipulate information, right? That is, that, that's really quite a true thing. And we need to do that for most things. And so, the, you know, that seems that kind of drumbeat continues. And so, and then working memory, you know, kind of unlike a lot of other capacities, it does sit at this, it straddles this portal between like a, a, a robust person level story about like, working memory, how working memory, you know, gives rise to consciousness and deliberation and intelligence and a subpersonal story where it's like, look, it's these, it's this beautiful thing. It's just delay period firing, right? That's what it is, you know? And, and, and I think that that connection is unique to working memory. You don't really see that kind of uh, moving between personal and subpersonal levels in like perception, for instance, work. Um, and I think for a long time, there's been attraction to working memory because there's something true about it that maintenance and manipulation matter in a computational story. The thing is, I think we need to respect that kind of polysemy, you know, the kind of many ways that the maintain maintenance and manipulation occur. So let me just give a brief story and then I'll stop talking. Uh, I remember I was at postdoc at Penn and I was sitting in a robot lab run by Dan Kotacek. And Dan's like, what do you do? And I'm like, working memory. And he's like, what's that? And I'm like, it's maintenance and manipulation of information. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, he's like, a vending machine maintains and manipulates information. I'm trying to build freaking robots. Come back when you have something I can put in a robot. <laughs> and I was like, oh man. But that really inspired me to be like, wait, what are the computational level descriptions? And, and are, are scientists agreeing on one or are they talking about many? And that's where I got this idea that, oh, maybe we should respect this kind of, that's why I don't want to throw it out. I, I think we, and so I think there is some story we can begin to tell about coming bottom up from the, from the neuroscience to this computational functional level and it's still hooking up with this kind of person level uh, uh commitment i just think that you know it's we have to do two things at once which is why it's very hard anyhow i hope that helps very good question right so, so i think like yeah so i think like the, the 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 other question that i want to ask is like somehow like in related to the, the thing that you answered so I, I think i agree that there's like like lots of like underlying ontological baggage that comes in um, with the, the sorts of like concepts we use to, to to do science, and we should definitely problematize it and like reflect at the at the at, at like the genetic sources and like identify the biases so that we can probably come up with better concepts and like um, do that. I, like I, I I do buy into that uh, for sure. I think the the thing that I I would be confused about and, and there the are two questions here. <laughs> you only get one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like, so, so I think like I should separate the question at two levels of abstraction. The first is, at a more methodological level, how do we actually identify that like, we, we have found like an adequate concept? Because like, sure, like all models are wrong, some are useful, like in that sense, like at, at every stage, there is some scope for like problematizing, like continuously problematizing what we're using, etc. But we also need to like get on with the engineering we also ah. need to go on with like problem solving etc right and 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 so it at a methodological level like it, it i think it's it's interesting to from like for me to, to understand like what heuristics are relevant to, mm -hmm. to to recognize like relevant levels of adequacy and related to this question i think is the, then the other side of the thing which is yeah i think I, it makes sense that like there's a sense in which like a lot of like ontologies that humans have used, like mentalistic, the manifest image of our understanding our own phenomenology is baked into a lot of ways in which we do cognitive science, which may not be the right way to do cognitive science. And then a lot of cognitive science ontology is baked into AI, which 
is even like another level of separation. Like there's a sense in which, and it, it does worry me that then like in that sense, we are trying to use somewhat restricted concepts to make sense of computations that are incredibly alien to the sort of computation that I am. Like we, we are trying to understand computations that are incredibly far in the space of possible minds from where my own self-conception of my uh, like mind it sits in that space or something. And that could be limiting, that could be limiting even in the ways in which like people like disagree about certain things for some people like AI is not truly intelligent yet. For some people, like it is like uh, the it is like still doing optimal planning, and like that is bad. And like like there's like lots of disagreements that still like probably invoke features or dimensions of talking about these these ontologies of, of like cognition or like um, like functional cognition even like mm -hmm. which may not be that relevant or applicable to the, to the subspace of the, these computations that are far away from the subspace that humans imagine themselves to be in. Mm -hmm. like these neural networks are like implementing incredibly weird and alien stuff, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. so, when, so for instance, when people are doing interpretability research, I think people are like assuming certain things of what to go out and look for inside mm -hmm. a neural network. And what they expect to find governs like what they, they want, like they will be able to find because like, it, it's like a mess of parameters inside. Like you, you, you can't like, like look for, it's pretty going to be hard to look for things that you're not already trying to find or expecting to find, right? Yeah. And in yeah. that sense, like it, it matters to like come up with the, to identify the right sorts of ontologies, cognitive ontologies that would be relevant for like understanding different sorts of AI systems or ML systems and like do the, the, the right sort of interpretability where we're using the right ontology to make sense of how, how to causally explain behavior from structure, right? And uh, yeah, like, and, 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 and yeah, like I would want to understand like how to do that. Um, how to actually move towards like those sorts of better and adequate ontologies without getting stuck in this like, in this near basin of human like concepts. Um, and yeah, like, so, so yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, like what, how would one actually go about like doing that? What are the heuristics one could apply to identify? Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, that's a really deep, deep. So I, I take, I take all those points. So uh, I, just to be brief, because it's a lot. I'm gonna have to. I wrote like three pages, so I'm gonna have to think about that. Uh, going back to the first one, so the method with identifying adequate concepts in philosophies of science, like what is a good heuristic to figure out when you have a good concept? Uh, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I think you'd have to probably have a pretty robust view about. <laughs> <laughs> like what philosophy of science is for. And I, I'm going to cop out by saying I'm a bit of a pragmatist and instrumentalist. So like it, they're tools that we're using uh, to uh, ideally to explain, organize, control, and, and predict behaviors uh, of phenomena or phenomena. Um, but that's a cop out. Like I'm not going to defend that in earnest because I'm not a real, I'm, this is where I'm going to say, I'm not a real philosopher of science. I just play one on TV. But um it's true in some sense. I think that's my intuitional pool. So it is something that's going to be consensus-based and sociological and messy and dirty. Uh, I just think that in cognitive science, we're doing a lot of leapfrogging for the kind of laundering reasons that I've explained. Uh, and so we're already trying, we it kind of relates to your second point. We are, we have an idea of what we should be finding. And, and so we want things to kind of, and, and that's, 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 that's biased towards this kind of explanation or providing explanations, material scientific explanations for the kinds of agents and creatures that we are or that we think we are. Um, and I think that we need to just chill out and maybe let some of our concepts, which arguably are the same ones that we've been using since Aristotle, uh, float a little bit <laughs> from the kind of explanatory end picture at the end of inquiry that we might have for how the mind works. Uh, that's, that's and, and in some sense I'm trying to, so Russ Paldrack had a really cute little thing where he did a corpus analysis 
of uh, James's Principles of Psychology, and he looked at how many of those constructs were present in contemporaries, his contemporary cognitive atlas, and it's about 24% of terms, so a quarter of terms from the cognitive atlas can be traced to James in 1890. Okay. In fact, that's why I signed James in, philosoph in philosophical psychology because I'm like, it's the same thing. <laughs> uh, and you can't do that with any other science. <laughs> he actually did a comparison with biology and it was orders of magnitude fewer terms from a contemporary ontology could you trace back, obviously, because DNA and micro, uh, microbiology and, and chemistry and everything. And so in some sense, there's been a shift of revolution in all these other sciences besides the mind. So, you know, two options present themselves. One is we have an intuitive introspective access and so we're right and we shouldn't worry. The other is that we need a revolution and, you know, and, I, and I'm more in that second camp. So that leads me briefly to your second question. So in terms of adequacy, I think, you know, we work with it as well as we can and we should, I, we should be, we should be thoroughly entertaining the skeptics and the pessimists. I think that's that's a, that's the kind of heuristic I want to sell. Um, the second part whew, that was really cool. Uh, I think I, I you're you. <laughs> uh, I think you're right that with these sciences, and it's really good to think about it in AI that we're basically going to be blinded by our pre previous knowledge of these other disciplines, and we're going to be looking for things that fit that mold. And I and you're basically asking like, how do we break free of that? I mean, in some sense, and this is really heretical, but I think it's, you know, once we once we break free of the grip of AI, like once we break free of like the, the I part <laughs> and even the A part, like it's something else. We're talking about other things. We're not talking about intelligence in this kind of like, you know, beating Kasparov way, which even psychologists don't talk about really anymore, unless they're doing like weird race-based like classification of IQs and shit. But most scientists are like, no, I mean, obviously there's, look at babies, look at groups, look at, you know, adults, look at group, look at people making decisions, look at foresight planning, look at, there's many ways that people are intelligent, right? So I think once we get rid of that grip of that and let it kind of, and that's a great, beautiful picture. I'd love, I'd love to see it kind of come through. It's like, if we take more of a bottom of approach and start classifying, what are the patterns that emerge when we like kind of let the data float free? And what are the islands that emerge in AI, in neuromorphic computing, um, once we kind of break free of our need to find uh, to, to 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 preserve you know the the idols from the past, I would love to see that. I don't really have a good intuition except do it, break free. <laughs> Excellent questions. I really appreciate it. Zach, where are we going? Yeah, so um, I'd like to get to uh, Sahil's question because it's a sort of uh, it's a sort of like fundamental question, just like outlining, uh, but he, he asked me to read it. So he's saying he's confused about uh, what exactly laundering is. Is it circularity, reaffirmation of philosoph philosophical commitments, conflating organization and explanation, uh, just trying to understand how far working memory is from the ranks of phlogiston if he buys, you know, if we buy into your story? Yeah, great question. Um, so uh, short answer is I don't quite know yet. Uh, long answer is I, I think that, so this comes from an idea originally from grad school, David Rosenthal, philosopher of mine, he argues that intuitions, like, you know, philosophers basically love intuitions. It's how we do our job, uh, by and large, just trading intuitions. And he thinks that largely intuitions launder in theory without, they smuggle in theory without doing any of the hard work. And that, that's always really caught my attention. And I think that's why I've been thinking about it. It's like, I think that what the scientists are doing and not on purpose, it's not like a pernicious thing usually, um, is they are grappling with pretty robust, especially the psychologists with constructs that are very robust, have a longstanding philosophical history with a lot of baggage associated with it. And they're just kind of uh, being like, yes, this thing, this is this this like computational story matches this like very deflated reduced caricature single plane slice of this rich philosophical contract hence consciousness is equated with a temporary store right and i and i think that that happens and it happens uncritically sometimes and it happens uncritically if you've ever published in psychology from the sociology of psychology 
So like in psychology, it's very hard to publish a paper being like, wait a second. <laughs> like, like I remember I used to have to publish psych, psych papers and it's really hard to be like, hey, wait, working memory is maintenance and information of information. Isn't every psychology study a study of working memory? Like even just remembering the not to just get up like and like leave the experiment <laughs> requires you to keep something in mind. So how do we, you know, you can't say that. <laughs> like, that's not how you get a paper public. Um, so long story, I think there's sociological reasons, but it's been uncritically adopted many times, which is very bad because then what happens is like, you know, the little meme where it's like the work, they're like the two stick figures and there's like a worker and he like gives something to the a little stick figure that has like a, a monopoly money hat on. And it's like the worker's like, I made this. And then the capitalist is like, he takes it and he's like, I made this. And that's, I think what happens with these terms is that the psychologist is like, oh, this thing is this super deflated reductionistic one slice caricature of this like big word <laughs> and mental, you know, psychology, con consciousness. And they're like, this is it. And then it's like 20 years pass. And then a philosopher is like, Hey, I really need like a, a empirical story for this these commitments I have about consciousness. And they stumble on a, a scientifically vetted realizer of consciousness. They're like, oh, I'll just this is this is it. This is perfect. I'll put this into my story without realizing that it's basically a redescription of commitments that we've already had. So it's not doing many much explanatory work. So that's the story about laundering. Um vis-a-vis uh, phlogiston and working memory. Uh, I think it's still, again, I'm just going to be real fast here. I think it serves some use because it can, if we, unlike phlogiston, arguably there are better constructs that can help organize how like uh, uh, a fire, like what fire is. Phlogiston's fire, right? <laughs> um, like plasma. And it's just like, oh, those are actually like little um, chunks of carbon that are really hot. And that's why they're giving off this light and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think maybe we'll come to a point where working memory is like phlogiston. I don't think we have good, I, I, you know, I, 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 I'm secretly off the record. Like if we just don't record, I think it's probably going to be something like that very soon, but I've been kind of cautioned by many people. It's like, Javi, if you work on working memory, you can't just like kill the thing you work on. <laughs> like you have to find a way to like keep the appearances. And this is a kind of, I think a genuine, I've been convinced now that this is a genuinely good way to keep it and not just get rid of it is by having it frame out this mosaic ontology so thanks great questions yeah yeah generally i have sympathies for this like uh worry that you start working on something and feel like well maybe we shouldn't be working on this or something <laughs> like that um but yeah uh simon's been really patient and i i suspect we're gonna get really good questions from simon <laughs> uh, so. Turn it over. Quick. I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> the uh, deceptive. Um, yeah. Uh, so um, I think I have so many disagreements with you on so many levels that it would take hours <laughs> to tease them all out. In particular, I think we would disagree about what explanations are, what understanding is, um, what uh, you know, whether the notion of univocal mechanism makes any sense. Um, what the norms of intellectual inquiry are in science, what the norms of communication are in science. Um, but I'm not going to get into any of that. I think, oh, sorry, do you, are you making notes of those? I am, I'm taking everything. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to cut to something that I think is a really core issue, which is when you say that working memory is the maintenance and manipulation of information, that does not give any flavor of the role that the distinction between different types of memory has within cognitive science and psychology. Maintenance and manipulation of information is involved in long-term semantic memory, episodic memory, working memory, motor skills, you know, basic, um, uh, the uh, regulation of heart rhythm. And all of those things are held to are held to be different by psychologists, partly for reasons that have to do with empirical results about how people respond in different tasks. Right. It could have been they, there could have been a theory. There's just this thing called memory and we just get to access it immediately, all of it, whenever we want. And it stays there forever. But it doesn't. There's, ev there's empirical evidence that that doesn't happen. Right. 
And you didn't mention any of that evidence that, that actually makes people think the concept of working memory specifically as a form of memory that's distinct from other forms of memory would be useful. So I think if you want to argue that, that working memory is a problematic construct, you cannot equate it with, it's the straw man to say that cognitive scientists and psychologists conceptualize it as the maintenance and manipulation of information. I think partly, I, you know, I'm just sort of speculating here, <laughs> pattern, common pattern that I see in philosophers talking about cognitive science and psychology is that they expect the intellectual norms of philosophy to be applied. Analytic philosophers like to try their best to give biconditional, like at least in the past, that was a gold standard of analytic <laughs> philosophy. We give a biconditional definition of something. By and large, scientists are, are never trying to do that. And when they give these sorts of you know, definitions, it is well understood that the audience will read it with a whole load of you know, as it were, this is in the rough area of what we're talking about. We're trying to gesture towards something important here. And and that, you know, when you see science, when you see the same thing expressed in different ways by different scientists, that they are not necessarily, that that is not necessarily anything bad, that there is just a, a lot of hand waving and gesturing towards something which everybody takes for granted. We don't have the capacity to be, to be more specific about for the moment. In order to understand what people mean when they use that concept, you cannot just look at the definitions that they give in their papers. You have to look at how they actually use it in practice and what sorts of phenomena they use it to explain and predict, what sort of predictions they make and why. Sorry. I, uh, that, so that, that's, I, that I think is, is, the, is, a, is the most important point, the most important so, objection I would raise. Yeah, no, I, I, excellent. I mean, this is wonderful. I, so I think I actually agree largely with you. Um, I, I think I still would preserve my view and this is why I'm, <laughs> you know, the problem with, so sidebar, uh, the problem with this working memory thing is like, this is usually what happens when I talk to a cognitive science about, uh, scientist about it, we're out to dinner or something like that. And I'm like, I don't think it's a real thing. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? Two hours later, and they either want me to shut up or they kind of agree, right? So they just say, yes, I think you're right. Because basically I'm saying, of course, I come from a cognitive neuroscience background. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, when I said these things, when I was, you know, an undergrad or I guess a master's student, you know, they were like, uh, yeah, we know, we know it's not like this thing that Badalay says it is. Like, duh, everybody knows that. Like, nobody thinks it's really that. Um, we just, just shut up and do the work. And, you know, we're just looking at our nice little pictures of how categories are maintained by interparietal cell co activation. Totally. And it's like, but it's like a whisper network. It's like the uh, hidden stare effect, right? Where it's like, you know, the, the, everybody in the office knows, that, oh, the, of course there's a hidden stare there. So you just kind of go around it. But then you get, the beauties of interdisciplinary discourse <laughs> and then you get the philosophers like Carruthers coming in and right. cherry picking from all these different views of working memory to kind of create this like chimeral monster that's actually super contradictory right um yeah. so I agree that the onus is in part I mean it's 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 overwhelmingly on the side of philosophers who dare get into the murky waters of trying to use empirical work to justify philosophical claims. I'm not really doing that though. I'm doing something else. It's slightly mm -hmm. kind of reversing that process. So, uh, and I agree. In fact, I would tell my students like, do not, you cannot read a scientific paper the same way you read a philosophy paper. You're 100% correct. It's super disingenuous. And you know, you can make a lot of hay about it but it won't convince anybody of anything. Um, in fact, David Barak, I think has brought up this point. He's a philosopher who's like now a neuroscientist you know, many, a million times. And, and I, I, I owe him a lot. So I, I think I agree with you. And I agree that largely it's the philosophers who dare use empirical stuff to justify things that have the onus of correctly interpreting scientific work. Um, that being said, I think there's a danger in having these kind of like whisper networky missing stare effects that is really, it's like, it's, it's really opaque to see, you have to almost just 
you only know it because you go to conferences in CNS Society and you know that people are in different cliques and talk about different things. And usually it's grouped by methods and pedigree and lab relations and all these weird sociological factors that like, okay, you know, we're all talking about working memory, but like really, oh no, I'm looking at how like oscillatory dynamics are important for encoding information and in temporal lobes under cognitive load. And like, so I'm going to hang out with Spitzer and all these other people who talk about oscillatory dynamics and maybe some TMS people, but not really fMRI people. They're like over here, they're talking about something else. And I, I think a lot of that, even in the literature is somewhat opaque. It's like, it's kind of preserved, not through written words on a, in a publication, but through who's publishing and what journal and who they're citing and how they're working. And that's a very opaque thing. And in fact, sidebar, this is the really robust view of the second paragraph rule, this machine learning dream I have, is to kind of render some of that opaqueness transparent by seeing like, look, there are different islands of scientists in working memory working on kind of different questions. And I think that that's, that that's a really useful thing to have. And I think to encourage interdisciplinary discourse down the road, that would be a really helpful mapping. Quite literally, I imagine it as a mapping of like what, you know, who you can almost, if you could categorize it by like the tools they're using, the regions they're asking, the tasks they're dealing with, and you could see that there's just different groups talking about different things. And that's not bad. And I think that we need to respect that. Go ahead. Sorry. So, so I guess they are talking about different things, but the things that they are talking about seem to them to be closely enough related that understanding something about one of them might provide insights about others. That's not true of, that's not true of material scientists working on hardness and people working on, you know, cortical activity in the, you know, the, the, the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. But it is true of people working in prefrontal cortical activity in the prefrontal cortex in the context of working memory tasks and um, psychologists who are gathering behavioral data about how people, what kind of things people can and can't remember under different, under different situations. Mm -hmm. There is some, there is a family resemblance. Yeah, I, I'm willing to buy that. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very generous man, and I'm willing to buy that. I'm also willing to think that that <laughs> is more is more related to these kinds of questions we have about cognition generally than some kind of memory system. So in fact, when you look at the work that's been done, sidebar to get at the first part of your question, uh, on ontology of memory systems, so this is by Cork and McKellian and whatnot in his whole group, they, I mean, his one big paper on this basically, they say, we don't, we don't even talk about working memory, which we think is just a fundamentally different kind of thing. Um, and so, in some sense, that's been my license to be like, I'm not going to talk about all the other kinds of memory, because it's true, you actually don't see a lot of uh, crosstalk. I mean, really, it's you see crosstalk between short-term memory people and working mm -hmm. memory people, um, long-term memory, but it's not much. Um, and one interesting effect that I wanted to talk about vis-a-vis -vis this is more recently in cognitive neuroscience, and this is, you see this in Brad Postle's work, and um, Stokes' work and a lot of like people working on this activity silence stuff is they kind of pushed away. They they pushed away from this idea that working memory is maintenance at all. They they're like that's short term memory. That's a different thing. That's more similar to what people do in episodic memory or long term memory, et cetera. What we're talking about is maintenance. Uh, or sorry, manipulation. And so they they segregate it. And the way they do it though is spurious because what they do is they say they don't give a not a definition, they don't even give an account of what maintenance manipulation is. They basically just say it's measured by, and then they give you a task. And in fact, there's a paper out there, I wish I had it on hand, that has like, it's categorized all the ma manipulation tasks that people use. And it is a pretty scattershot just thing. And look, I'm just saying, that's an interesting question that we need to solve in the psychological level. Like, what do we expect that these tasks have to deal with each other? <laughs> And, and, and how could they inform each other by learning which brain re regions are recruited for, for one or the other? But at that point, we're getting on the other side of the dilemma where it's like, okay, whatever that is, and that might be a real thing, and we might need to learn about it, isn't going to be the thing that attracts the like, and maybe they're just bad 
sophists, the, the people like Badley, or the philosophers who are attracted to working memory. I think if working memory were reduced to like, it's this thing that allows for the online information and manipulation of arithmetic and semantic constructs under these kinds of, uh, like, like in these kinds of tests, philosophers would just leave that thing alone. Like they probably would if it had stayed like Broadbent's model or Atkinson's model or anything like that. But I mean, I, I, long story short, I don't, we should get a beer and chat about this for a few hours. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I take a lot of your points very seriously. And I think this is why this ultimately has to be part of a book project. Because every time I try to do this working memory thing, you know, people come at me from all these different angles. And I think the real story needs a, all these things to be taken into account because a lot of your points are very well taken. I think. I, I think I think I'd be inclined to say that it's not clear to me whether the it's not clear to me whether the notion of working memory um, how useful a notion it is. Now, as TJ says, like all models are wrong, some are useful. I would add, um, all models are wrong. The contexts in which they are useful can be broader or narrower. Mm. Right. Um, so I like I, I kind of take it for granted that the, that, the, that the truth of the matter is something like there's a complex picture and we can simplify it, um, you know, and then when we simplify it, there is something that looks a bit like, you know, working that is recognizably similar to, uh, you know, modern conceptions of, of working memory, although in not at, not in any way that we can currently delineate in a sort of biconditional, using biconditional mm. style definitions. Um, like that, that would be my, that would be my feeling. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 so sidebar, uh, last sidebar, mm -hmm. I promise. My, my, I did a poster on this, like my first like real work on this 10 years ago. And it was literally called why working memory is not a good or useful kind term. <laughs> so, I mean, I think I was swishing a lot in there and I honestly, I probably should have just, I didn't even apply to an HPS program. I probably should have, uh, <laughs> But I think, because yeah, I'm, I'm just, I feel underprepared to have these debates about explanation, et cetera, when really, you know, my, my core philosophy of science training was Peter Godfrey Smith's classes on like pragmatism. So I, mean, uh, I feel a little bad, but, uh, uh, but I, I, I do think I buy that. I think that scientists use it in this tokeny way that I've talked about to, to signal and sociological membership. I think that's why they're not really willing to give it up, even though they acknowledge that it's not necessarily a useful model for anything beyond that organizational property. So they're already doing the kind of Brachian ontology them asking philosophers to do. I think I'm, I'm, it's like moss to a flames. Philosophers are really attracted to mm -hmm. this maybe character, this mischaracterization of working memory is just this magic box that allows for the generative capacity. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's an interesting question I'm still wrestling with. It's like, can you build a real mental a model of mental of mind or agency that lacks such a generative little almost mini homunculus thing in it? And I mean, that's a separate question altogether. But I, I yeah, that's the one I've been trying to come to grips with as well. And I think we need to as philosophers. I, I mean, like, I think so. It looks to me like. Like there are real questions about, um, as it were, how memory is organized. Like how how is it that we are able to retain stateful information about the the outside world that comes in through our senses and then funnel that into appropriate behavior in ways that are often suboptimal in the sense that it takes us, so it takes a while for the information to filter through yeah. or it can get disrupted or it can require specific cues in order for it to filter through or like all of those complex things where there's, where it's not just, oh, we store this information and then we use it. No, we store this information and then, well, sometimes we use it and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we have to, you know, not have competing, you know, attentional requirements in order to use it and some and etc 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 and it, it seems to me like you know in principle you know one can imagine systems in which those flows and bottlenecks are structured very very differently mm. from how they're 
structured in humans. Maybe even in octopi, they're structured very differently from how they're structured in humans. Um, you know, let alone like robots that we construct using weird quantum computers. Um, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I love the pluralism. I think so. So uh, to answer, I mean, there's no, I mean, I'm just going to th put, 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 throw some two cents into that. So I, I love the suboptimality thing. And to me, this is kind of the, like, so this is another kind of critique of philosophy uh, where we are enchanted, especially in philosophy of mind, with finding explanations for the exceptional. Like we want to have the exceptional be like, well, well, look, I mean, <laughs> Newton came up with the calculus by himself. <laughs> uh, so mind should be able to do that. And <laughs> and the problem is like that's if you're if you're then saying, okay, well, our our goalpost for like a model of mind is like this, you know, dude who's like sitting alone in a room coming up with the calculus. That's a pretty robust yeah, and, computation. And, story. and by the way, has the economic and social privilege to, to of have course, free right. time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> just be alone, like God willing. I wish I could. Um, so uh, I think most people by that, if that's your goal, if that's your epistem, or if that's your yard post, uh, that's going to be really hard to meet. And most people by that yard post are going to be suboptimal. Um, but the fun thing is, since humans were evolved as social creatures, maybe coming up with the calculus shouldn't be like the goal for a story of cognition. Maybe it should be like, how do I immediately go into a room and tell like who's hooking up with whom and who can I sit with? And like, those are really complicated cognitive problems. Yeah. That they're not so those, that our stories are designed to solve. And I think our stories need to, well, we need to have better you, stories. Well, you say that those are exactly the kinds of questions that the stories that are told by 4E cognitive scientists are supposed to solve. Yes. No, not the I, stories yeah. that are told by like traditional computationist representationist com cognitive scientists. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. I think, so I want to push it even further, though. So like this has been some people tell me like, Javi, hasn't this just or to be even less generous, like Sperber and uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sperber and Wilson, uh, not Sperber and Wilson, Mercier and um, Sperber. What's his name? Yeah, that's I'm getting it right. Hugo, the, uh, the enigma of the enigma of reasons, you know, this whole like, oh, reasons actually this kind of more social process. They're like, oh, you know, it's 40 years like Everybody knows that there's like group cognition, et cetera. I'm like, no, no, no. I want to push it a little bit further. I want to say that the, the, the concepts themselves, things like deliberation, reasoning, reflection, rationality, these things are, are stories that still have at their core a kind of privileging of this individualist position. And like what we do in collective or group circumstances is a kind of derivative or parasitic process. And I think for a lot of these cases, it's an open question, at least empirically, that maybe the actual process that, that, that should be privileged, the like paradigmatic one is a social one. And in fact, the individual case is parasitic. So like, one last little story. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I think we can preserve this like virtual omnipresent, super generative, super productive, computationally robust workspace view of working memory. It's just not going to be in the head. It's going to be a virtual workspace that's realized using language either with oneself over time or with others in real time. And, and that's how you can get your, your appearance and you know save it too. Okay, so I so I want I want to resist that. Uh, so firstly, I want to resist the idea that there's there's a sort of universal context in which context. certain things should be privileged or not. I suspect that what that the 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 kind of the concept that should be privileged is context dependent because I'm a pragmatist. So you should be privileging whatever thing it is useful for you in your explanatory context to privilege. Which is going to vary from person to person. Um, so I want to I want to challenge that, but we can just let, let's just leave that to one side. I guess the other thing that I want I want to do is to this pluralist permissivist kind of you know notion of you know where like where memory is, and I'm totally on board with the notion of extended cognition but i absolutely want to resist the idea that distinctions should be blurred between um the external memory the sorts of external memory devices that we use like phones and you know pen and paper and, and all the rest of it um 
and um, the sorts of uh, memory that is that, that we store internally. And the reason for that is a very dynamicist reason, which is to do with the timing of task performance. The speed of information flow between those things and the relevant actions is very different, and that matters. It can make the difference between life and death. Yeah, no. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, I have to think more about this. So I don't know if that's what I'm arguing. I think I'm, I'm not, what I'm trying to say is like some of these core cognitive constructs that are the person level, more robust ones, things that the, I blame the philosophers for pinning on working memory. Those things I'm saying, maybe some of them, some of them have a more social story that's better as like the model of how we do it. So just to give you a sense, I think a lot of these problems, and I haven't written this out yet. I have to go through a lot of Peter's work at, at Cincinnati, Laglan Hassan, is about inner speech. So like inner speech is this weird thing, right? Where it's like, if language is computationally as robust as we think it is, where it's productive, compositional, systematic. And if we have it in well, our head, who, who, think, who thinks it's like that? Uh, Jerry, <laughs> Lauren Chomsky. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. I mean, yeah. there's this new BBS article by my good friends, uh, you know, Eric and Nico Poirot, and of course Jake Quilty Dunn reaffirming it. So it's it's a story, right? You can tell. Right. If you if you're if you think that's the case, and if you think that we have internal speech, so we have a little thing in the head that is just as powerful. And if you think that the paradigmatic, you know, uh, TED Talk case for working memory is like, oh, trying to remember a phone number. How do you do it? You use inner speech in your head and you rehearse it using this phonological loop. Uh, and you think that inner speech has all these powerful things. Then you kind of, it's very easy to make the enthymematic jump between, oh, working memory has this module that's inner speech that has these properties and all the amodal stuff that governs working memory that's subpersonal in the background also has those high level computational properties. And I think that's an error that's been made. And that's one of the things that, oh, it's not an error. I think it's a live empirical question. And that's one thing that we should kind of keep on the uh, surface. So it's it's more that I think things like inner speech might actually be better understood as parasitic. And, and the fact that we can deliberate by like reasoning in our own mind using inner speech is parasitic on maybe some social thing. I think you're right that there's a distinction a relative rel a relevant computational distinction between so-called extended memory and like internal memory and and that's something that that's uh, you know cashed on dynamicist terms but it's a timing thing and i think it's i i agree with it's salient and i wouldn't want to argue that they're the same thing though i think that it's interesting that the first real full-throated accounts of working memory argue that they are the same because they're not arguing because they're arguing for like this very thin functional notion of like it's whatever helps you get stuff done which is really they're taking yeah. quite literally from new and simon which is like the machine could have infinite working memories of any size all over the place it's just it's, it's a scrap pad that like gets thrown away so i think that that's that's the the gist that i'm trying to th take from here is that like if we're willing if what, what attracts us to working memories is thin functional notion then we can see it everywhere uh, and, it, and, but if that but if it tracks that, then it's not really distinct from you know motor skills or um, uh, you know episodic memory or you know then it's just some then, sort of stateful stateful information storage. Yeah, it's super thin. And actually, I think that some people, yeah, kind of have to accept that weird view that it's just a new term for a lot of cognition. Um, now, most scientists don't because they're not concerned with that. They're trying to map out a specific computational story that's implemented in a right place that has a, and I think like mapping that out would be so useful. Imagine having like a very like clear mapping of these possibilities. And then, so one of my hopes would be that we can start having this actual mapping of all these different ways that we do maintain and manipulate information. And then we start actually associating patterns of how those different mechanisms or how those different processes are recruited that are characteristic and tend to co-occur with other tasks. So then we can see like, oh, reasoning about your friend is like 
grouping together a bunch of these different subcomponents that are different pathways of maintenance and manipulating information. And maybe there's characteristic changes of that corralling of those subcomponents over the lifespan. Maybe you could even argue some are culturally distinct. Maybe in different animals, you could see different kinds of collating uh, coalitions of these maintenance and manipulation um, uh, uh, realizers. That's my hope. And it would be great to then extend it to like, I. God, the one thing I wanted to do with Peter Godfrey Smith so badly was octopus working memory. Uh, but I just, I couldn't figure out like, how do you even design a task for that? Um, maybe each arm has one. I don't know. I think you're right. So uh, a great, very, 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 very fruitful question, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I've got, lo I've got loads more comments I can make if nobody else wants to, but I think I should pass to somebody else at this point. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think at this point it's it's maybe just up to Javi how much you want to stick around. Um, Four minutes, and then I gotta go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I gotta that's... get driving in just a bit. But it's been this is insanely. I, mean, I shouldn't say that's ableist, but it's been very, it's been a very, very good uh, thrashing. I mean, my goal is I'm getting. I have a. I'm very lucky. I have a junior sabbatical set up for next spring, and I'm, I've applied to a couple places to just chill out with philosophers of science. Because I just, this is for the book project, this is what I need. Like people who are just like, wait a second. Like, because I feel like I can still preserve the gist of my story. Every every critique you've given me, I feel like I have some affinity with, but I still have this like purity of, of heart that no, 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 the philosophers are wrong and the scientists are onto something and there's something, a new story that can be told. Uh, I just need to have the better back, you know, the better background on, yeah, explanation and and science. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, sorry, I'm I'm super I'm super happy to have that have that beer at some point. Um, Me possibly, too. Uh, probably virtually. Um, oh well. And I'm happy never for never stopped me before. <laughs> Zach, I'll I'll let you have the last word on this. Um, yeah, so I, I mean, I had a, I had a question that it could, we could talk about more, but um, it really, a lot of it is just for a reading suggestion. Um, so I'm curious if you've like come across people doing good, like historical work, or if you have like maybe done some yourself looking at how uh, concepts and metaphorical language has like gone from psychology to computer science back to psychology back to computer science like it seems like at this point i'd be really interested in, in um uh, you know and maybe i'm just gonna have to start doing some of this work more myself when i get more free time after coursework um but <laughs> free i'm time. really interested to, <laughs> right? yeah free time exactly um but i'd be really interested in like somebody really telling some of these stories about like this like constant back and forth because it seems like at this point like in the context of working memory you're dealing with concepts that are, you know, where initially we were starting to call memory and computer systems because we were like relying on metaphors from how human, how we understand human psychology. But then like once you get into cognitive science, the way we're thinking of memory is like influenced by how we've organized, you know, memory and computational systems. And like by the time you get to the present, you've just seen this like um, sort of interwoven uh, tapestry of like concept you know, pollination across the field. So I, in particular, like if you just have like reading suggestions for- Yeah, that's, that's a great, I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to do that story too. I mean, it's just slightly out of my expertise because I wasn't trained as like a historian of ideas or, or science, right. but, but like, you know, I'd love to get a sabbatical where I can just go to like the Center for Philosophy of Science and just like jump, because actually a lot of these things I got when I was looking through the old volumes that have never been checked out from- the 70s on like these old like you know learning and memory volume one <laughs> from 76 and then 77 is like volume two and you just kind of go back and you see all the like the 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 the, the concepts that people used to get tenure that just like have been fading and just like didn't get picked up and I think working memory was very very much in danger of this I think it was probably going to happen and then Badalay and you know what Badalay did Badalay was like a linguist so he's he's taking his like uh, his stims, his stimuli, his stimuli, and his 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 tasks and his paradigms from linguistics and psycho and psychological linguistics, 
and being like, oh, there's this thing. And I can just reuse all this crap that I have laying around to test it. Atkinson and Schiffer never did like empirical, well, they didn't really do empirical tests of it. They just kind of stipulated it as a model and did some kind of like uh, recency, primacy, memory list things. But Badley really refined it. And I think it's in some part because he was able to provide a suite of easy to replicate, easy to access tool stimuli and paradigm that other scientists could do, that that's what kicked it off into popularity. So it's kind of by luck. Like, I, I don't think there was anything teleological that meant that it had to be working memory. There was also Broadbent had a model that was like based off of a um, rotary phone switcher. Like it was called like this uh, selector attention. And it was like literally based on like how like a big phone company would like move information around. So they could have just been that model instead, right? Um, and so I think that that's a absolutely worthy project would be super fascinating. The closest thing I have, and it's been a while since I try to crack this open is Kat Stinton, who's a professor at um, Queens University in Canada. Do you know her, Catherine Stinton? So she's pivoted into AI and animal stuff, but she originally was like doing a lot of mechanism stuff with Jackie Sullivan, also at okay. Western University, Western Ontario. And they have a paper tracking med uh, mechanistic metaphors. Uh, so like all the way back to like Descartes and, you know, the pooling of the limbs and into, um, I think, uh, who was the guy who did the, oh my goodness. <coughs> What's his name? Condi conditioning salivation being Pavlov Pavlov how he was influenced by um like phone connections and phone line operators and then James was really influenced by uh his models were based off of uh, uh trolley signals and like trolleys moving around and so I mean I think that these are very plentiful all over the place I think they're just getting to the point where maybe they're more pernicious and and I don't know why that's a really good question maybe just the impacts maybe the fact that philosophers have picked back up on it maybe that maybe kind of to tj's point actually that they are really starting to constrain and that's the, that's the pernicious fear of the laundering that i really have to take home that they're constraining